We are live. Hello, humans. So fast. Mm-hmm. Um, what is our episode number? This is 644. Dang. Mm-hmm. It's a big number. I, I can just barely count this high. <laughs> so you know we're... We've reached so I so I've turned into su into summer Fraser. You have. Which is yeah, yeah. You can see the 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 sun, the the sort of lobsterish color that's been added to my pallor thanks yeah. to sun finally, <laughs> finally showing up. Um, so we have sun. I just clearly have not been going outside. Um mm -hmm. I can't resist. Like we're in a you know, we're in a trailer, so I just I got I gotta get out. And yeah. So, and so I just spent most of the last we, the the clouds have returned now but 4 days in in the sun uh working on the land, going for walks, hanging out with friends. Awesome. Yeah, it's been good. See, I'm I'm currently in denial about um how bad our weeds are. And if I go outside, I'm going to have to acknowledge the weeds. So, so these, the solution to weeds is is wood chips. You just let people deliver you mountains of wood chips. You get them like a foot deep. And, oh, uh, see, I, 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 here we have to pay for wood chips. I don't know if you have to pay for wood chips. You can't. So, I mean, if you're industrious, you can talk to the different tree companies, but they, but now there's so many people that want their wood chips that now they can actually sell them. It used to be that they would, they were garbage and they yeah. would pay you to take them off their hands. Yeah. But a lot of cities, and I'm not sure if yours is the case, will have a common wood chip, uh, will have like a common wood chip dump place that you can just go and take, a, you know, garbage cans and fill them up. So... There might be some I'll, options nearby for, for your city. I'll need to look for that. But as far as I know, the city collects wood chips and then uses them around the city. Y yeah. Yeah. So, so the, it used to be that you would, that all the tree companies, they mm -hmm. had to take their wood chips to the dump. And, oh, and so that's if you bad. were near, well, I mean, you know, the dumps recycling, the dump has a huge composting facility. Okay. And okay. so, and, but it would, you know, our dump is fairly far out of town, but in a lot of cities. And so they need a place to take these steps. And so if you talk to the tree companies and, and then they, th this happens so much now that they have lists. And so they'll put you on a list and say, if they're, if they're, if they're doing any wood chipping in your area, yeah, they'll drop them off at your house because it's it only takes them five minutes to get to you as opposed to an hour to do a return run from the, from the dump or the compost facility or whatever. So I would still, I'm still checking into it. And they're, you know, they're, they're so great. I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing. You, the wood chips seem completely dry and then you just dig down an inch or two and suddenly it's completely wet and, and, you know, very good conditions for growing stuff underneath. Yeah. Yeah. Wood chips are the best. Yeah. We, we usually put down like, two to three inches a year because that's what I can afford. Yeah. Now, are you talking about mulch or like are you, like bark mulch or wood chips? Bark mulch. Yeah. So you don't, so the, I mean, bark mulch looks pretty, but it is expensive. While the wood chips are just people being, you know, grinding up their trees. Hmm. Like Okay. I need to look into this more. I yeah. So like, a, like a, a, a tree trimming company will come to someone's house yeah. and, and trim some giant oak tree. Yeah. And, and then, then it goes, yeah. And then they grind yeah. it all up into little, into chips. So, yeah. and then they, they, they do that just to, to minimize the size because right. you can turn a tree into a small pile of chips and yes. move it with your, your truck. So, uh, but it's an amazing reason. It's like absolutely amazing. As, okay. You know, if you, if you do any gardening, if you can get your hands on, and it's different than wood chips because it has green mixed in with it. Usually, it'll have like leaves, like yeah, the leaves of the tree mixed in with the branches of the tree. So you get this actually really nice mix of greens and browns. That then, when you put on your garden, is terrific. You just don't want to you don't want to till it into the ground because then it can steal the nitrogen as it rots. Yeah. But if you just put it on top as a mulch, then it fantastic yeah um and 
you know, if you get the right relationship, you, you can have as much, like, they'll deliver dump truck loads of the stuff for free. Damn. You, just, okay. you just have to take it, you know, shift it around to your property. Um, but I'm like, you know, I've, 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 I have so much gardening to do and I have so many woods, to, trees to chip up. I'm, I'm probably just going to be buying my own wood chipper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Like, a, Fair enough. like a big one. Yeah. Yeah. We have a, a tree over our garage that has a bunch of limbs that are considering falling onto the garage. Yeah. So getting someone to come wood chip them into yeah. our yard could be super yep. beneficial. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you'll pay them to, to like prune the tree back. Yeah. And then they'll chip all the all the chips on the spot, and they'll say, "Do you want to keep them, or do you want us to take them?" And that, and often people say, "Take them," but you say, "Keep them." I I shall do yeah. that. I shall yeah. definitely do that. Yeah, and it's and especially we had a we had a branch come off of our one of our trees and hit our neighbor's house, <laughs> so did no damage. It was super lucky, but still kind of uh, a little unnerving that 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 can happen. All right, let's do our jobs. Yeah, yeah, I suppose we should do that. Okay, I am pulling all the windows I need to the front. Ben Kalo, how do I keep the milkweed from taking over everything? Well, I mean, milkweed is a great plant, though, like for for monarch butterflies and other kinds of butterflies. So what was I, that? I, I wouldn't try to stop it, but if you did. The answer is wood chips. You just like cover them in wood chips, grass, invasive grasses, anything. You know, you put a foot of wood chips on top of anything, and it's done. I have an and echo. it just makes the ground so much more nutritious. Where is it coming from? One moment. Something somewhere is upset. Hello. Echo, echo, Still echo. Have an echo. I don't hear an echo from this side. I hear myself twice. Hmm. You got a monitor so on somewhere? Confusing. I must. Yeah. Okay, I don't see a monitor there. And That's I only funny. hear me twice. Ben saying his milkweed spread. Like, I wish we could grow milkweed here. I would love to have milkweed. Hmm. Such good, good plant for butterflies. Did I fix it? I fixed it. Okay. Echo, echo, echo. I don't have one now. It is glorious. Hooray. Okay, so now I just need to press all the record buttons, all of them. All of them? Well, I have record on the video, mm, and then video I Video have... and the audio. Yep. So now yeah. everything is recording. I am also recording. Excellent. All right. Are you... Remind me when we finish this to talk about... Actually, I'll talk about this in Astronomy Cast as well, because we need to get the word out some more. All right. Okay. So when you're ready. I am ready. Okay. Astronomy Cast, episode 644. Oh. We what? did it. Well, I'm just thinking about. Uh... <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give this a different title. Okay. Astronomy Cast. Oh. Done? Okay. Astro <clears throat> Silent. All right. All right. Are you done? Mm -hmm. Okay. Astronomy Cast, episode 644. Is the Earth normal? Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly fact based journey through the cosmos. We help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy journalist for over 20 years. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I am doing well. It is spring. We have tornadoes, yeah. but not today. Yes. So, so I need to give the most, man, I don't even know how to describe this. I need to give the most weasel word ridden excitement 
potential thing to do coming up. Okay, and go for that, it. Okay, and so that is that there's potentially, maybe, possibly, the greatest meteor storm yes. in, in decades, maybe centuries, happening on the evening of May 30th, or the morning of the 31st. Tau Hercules. Depending on where you live. Get your, get your hammock Hercules ready. Meter. Get your hammock yes. ready. Yeah. So the what happened was this comet, and I'm not even going to say the name, 73P, broke up in 1995. And there's great Hubble pictures of this. The comet yeah. exp expanded in brightness 400 times and tore itself apart. And we passed through the Tau Hercules every May 30th, 31st, every year. But this time it's possible that we're going to be passing through the point where the comet broke up and it all depends on the math. But what that means is that we could see not like when you go out and you watch the Perseid meteor shower during the summer and you have like a really good time, you're like, woohoo, you're watching one meteor a minute, 60 yeah. meters an hour during a meteor storm, like the 98 Leonids or the 66 Leonids people were seeing upwards of, a thousand an hour and i saw them and they were absolutely incredible yeah. so some predictions for this storm are i've seen ten thousand an hour a hundred thousand mm -hmm. an hour i've seen 40 me meteors a second which is a hundred and forty thousand an hour and with that comes a distribution of not just regular meteors but also fireballs and everything bolides like it's just going to be bonkers but it's not certain. And yeah. so it's, it's going to be peaking at 10 p.m. Pacific time on, on May the 30th, 1 a.m. Eastern time or 0500 universal time. And so that means it's best positioned for North America, South America, a little bit of Europe. But don't like an old people are like, Oh no, I'm in Australia. Oh no, I'm in South Africa. Oh no. I'm, you know, don't like meteor storms are famously unpredictable. Yeah. We, we get these, we get these kinds of warnings all the time and they never show up. And so this almost certainly won't happen, but if it does, it'll be amazing. And it'll, it, it's almost certain that it'll be early or late. So don't panic just on that night, go out, and if it's happening, like we'll see a rise in meteor activity as we get closer and closer to the peak, and then the peak happens, and then we'll see declining meteors. So everyone on Earth should be able to get a shot at seeing this, whether you're in the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere. This is for everybody. Mm -hmm. It could be the meteor storm of a generation, but it could also be nothing. So don't yell at me. This, this is an excuse to go camping if you like to go camping. Yeah. This is an excuse to upgrade your hammock if you're thinking maybe this summer I need a better yeah. hammock. Yeah. Uh, we won't be recording next Monday. It is Memorial yeah. Day here in the U.S. But also, like, I, I plan to use this as an excuse to put more hammocks in the backyard <laughs> and have people yeah. over and yeah. have a fire. And, and even if you're in a city, yeah. like if you're in the middle of a city, oh, you'll it, still be able to see it. Bullets. If you're... Yeah, it'll be it'll be like like a minute forty a second. So the sky is going to be just it's going to be raining yeah. stars, and so you'd see more in the dark, in you know in the if you're far away from the city lights. But you'll still see a lot if you're in a big city. So this is for everybody. Yeah, everybody. And again, um, you know we don't we, there's no guarantee that this is going to happen. And but the way I always say it is that you miss one hundred percent of the meteor storms that you don't stand outside to watch. It's true. So, so don't blame me if you decide that to not watch it, and then it is turns out to be the storm of the century. Get your bug spray. Get an old <laughs> AM/FM radio that you can tune in to hear them striking the atmosphere, and yeah. then tell us what you saw. Awesome. All right, we have done an episode about whether or not our solar system is normal. Now we want to talk about our planet. We've now discovered thousands of exoplanets. And we're learning more and more about the kinds of planetary systems that are out there across the universe. But are planets like Earth unique or totally rare? And we'll get into this in a second, but it's time for a break. And we're back. 
So we think about planet Earth. I mean, again, astronomers like the assumption was Earth is normal. Earth is this is this there in every star system. There will be a terrestrial planet that is close to the habitable zone. It, it, the solar system has three of them. Um, so now that we're starting to learn about more and more exoplanet systems. What kinds of factors do we think are going to find out? <laughs> One moment, one moment. I think Lindsay just got here. Is that you, Lindsay? Mm. Yep. Oh. One second, Lindsay. Come say hi to Astronomy Cast. I am. Oh my God, Astronomy Cast. I am so sorry. It's okay. It's your show Hello. now, Lindsay. I'm ruining everything. <laughs> only we had editors I totally I'm so sorry. <laughs> all right your half hour was just shorter than i anticipated <laughs> you're fine <laughs> okay sorry all right Fraser, can let, me ask we... you, let me ask you i'll let me ask you the question again okay sorry rich right. sorry ali you ready she's taking the dogs away okay Malachi is like, no, come, I'm not. Does leaving. she come bearing treats? Yes, yes, she That's, did. Yeah, no wonder they're so stoked to see her. All right. Yeah, she got dog treats. Okay, go ahead. So when we think about this idea of like, is the is planet Earth normal, right? Like we now know of many, many exoplanets out there. Are we getting a sense? Because like I think in the past we would think like in every sol star system there will be a Venus like planet and an Earth like planet and a Mars like planet. There will be a terrestrial planet in the habitable zone of the star, and there could be life there. Are we getting a sense of, of how similar Earth is to other kinds of terrestrial planets out there? So we're in this super weird time right now where we have started finding rocky worlds. We have started finding things that are roughly the size of Earth, but we can't find them around sun-like stars yet. So we're only finding rocky worlds next to tiny, tiny stars that have tiny, tiny habitable zones right up next to their surface. So we have found potentially habitable worlds that orbit every 11 days while probably being tidally locked and- Right. Yeah. Experiencing flares from the red dwarf star. But it's still encouraging because we've gone from this point where the, the first, planet found around a normal star was found um it was a super giant snuggled up or well, not a super giant it was a uh super jupiter snuggled up right next to its star 51 peg and uh it was far hotter than we knew planets could exist and so we started out with this canonical idea prior to to that of solar systems are going to be rocky 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 gassy gassy icy random stuff right and then we were like oh no it's it's hot jupiter hot jupiter hot jupiter and that was all we found and then <laughs> kepler came along and it was like no 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 wait you were impatient and started finding other kinds of solar systems, leading us to understand we have no idea how solar systems are formed and they're gonna do whatever they want and form however they want. And the more we're able to see, the more we hope to be able to find that Earth 2.0 out there around that Sun 2.0 star. But right now, we're kinda unique as far as we know. So, so what can we learn about the kinds of terrestrial planets that have been found? And also, like, what do we know about the Earth and, and which factors we think might be contributing to us being maybe more unique? It's not really so, a word you should use. More. <laughs> it's special. Every child is special. That yeah. can mean so many things. You can't be more unique or less unique. You're, it's you're true. Either unique or you're not. That's all. It's true. Yeah. So, um, what we're looking at is is we still have this Goldilocks problem in our solar system of Venus is too hot, Mars is too cold, Earth is just right, and this is my air presser compressor deciding it too needs to join in on the show. 
So we're just going to wait through the air compressor because everything in my house is going to make noise today. Mm -hmm. That's my life too. I don't know why the air compressor decided right now, right now. Because it's funny for the lulls. Oh, I totally hear it. Yeah, it's a very determined air compressor. Mm -hmm. It normally doesn't go for this long. Hi all, we are waiting through my air compressor that decided spontaneously to compress air for unknown reasons right now. It's just compressing away. There's no one in the room with it. There's no need for it to compress. There's a water pump, there's an air compressor, there's dogs, okay. there's humans. It's all just Today is the day, folks. Today is the, f the day everyone tries to become an audio star. All right, it's over. It's done? Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, so, so, so we remain in this weird Goldilocks situation where Venus is too hot, Mars is too cold, and we're just right. But our understanding of how we got here has evolved. Mars doesn't have enough of a magnetic field, so it lost its atmosphere, but it once had oceans. Venus, it doesn't really have a magnetic field. All sorts of chaos went on over there. Uh, it has a super thick atmosphere, and we now think that something catastrophic occurred anywhere from a few million to a few hundred million years ago that took it from being an ocean world to being what we see today. And that's a bit terrifying to think about. Were those Venus and Mars problems as opposed to habitable zone problems? Like those if, were Venus and Mars problems as opposed to yeah. habitable world problems. Right. So if, so if Venus was, had a different atmospheric composition or a different mass, would it be, it could be as habitable as Earth and even same with Mars, if it yeah. had maybe a thicker atmosphere and, you know, a, but a, a lot more mass, like there could could have been three completely habitable worlds in the solar system, if you just fine tuned their so Mars their chemicals a little bit. Yeah, Mars, you you'd have to like change its mass to allow it. Yeah, to... no, no, the same mass as Earth. If Mars was the same yeah. mass as Earth, Venus was the oh, same right. mass of Earth. Venus had maybe a thinner atmosphere than Earth. Mars had a thicker atmosphere than Earth. You could probably balance out all three in terms of energy budget. And I think the rotation rate is something we also have to pay attention to with Venus because Venus somehow got flipped upside down rotationally. Right. And it's rotating so slowly that its day exceeds its year. And and that changes the mixing that's able to go on in its core. So had the sets of collisions that occurred in our solar system been different, had that Mars-sized world that hit the proto-Earth maybe hit the proto-Mars and made something much bigger, had whatever hit Venus not hit at the angle it hit at and changed its rotation the way it did, it could have been a completely different scenario. Yeah. And we're still trying to figure out even the role that Earth's moon has. There mm -hmm. are some ideas that without Earth's moon and the tidal forces it puts on our world, we might not have been able to support life the way we do today. And, and so there's all of these what ifs. And until we're able to start consistently finding and studying smaller worlds around sun-like stars where that habitable zone is further out and you're not getting tidally locked. It's just computer models all the way down. All right, we're going to talk about this more, but it's time for another break. And we're back. Right. So then, I mean, it is interesting how we've got these other examples just in our solar system, how things can go wrong and make planets that are uninhabitable today. Yes. Where with Venus, no planet-wide magnetosphere, 
a horribly thick atmosphere of carbon dioxide, sulfuric acid. It personifies death from the skies. Yeah, yeah, it's hell. Yeah. And then on Mars, low mass, dead interior, not a thick enough atmosphere, couldn't hold on to its atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera. And then with Earth, we've got a, a large moon keeping us stable, but also probably no giant impact that rolled us over on our side since the moon. Right. And more than that, we have this constant mixing going on from the tidal forces where we see the ocean tides, we see the surface of the planet actually rising and falling as the moon goes by. And this creates a small amount of heating. We have the radioactive interior that has the heating. All of this comes together to put us in a situation where our planet is still mushy on the inside and driving a nice healthy magnetic field. And, and Venus just doesn't have that. And this also makes us start to wonder just what role did life have on preserving life on our world as well. Hmm. Uh, we know that in the past there were methanogens that created a methane rich, uh, more greenhouse gassy atmosphere than the oxygen creating life came along, changed the atmosphere wildly. And all the wildlife has its own effects on the biosphere, creating, as we talked about with uh, our episode, three episodes back, a world that itself may be called alive insofar as having a biosphere impacts how the planet evolves. That's interesting um, that there are effects on the planet in terms of say it's albedo with the yes. reflectivity or the amount of absorption that happens of, with the forests and and things like that 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 can be factors to life now when you you know you started out this conversation talking about how all these hot jupiters were found and that really was a was an outflow of an outcome of the the most powerful telescopes and techniques that we had at the time exactly. the radio velocity technique and so you're gonna find the well, it's weird that all the planets we find are giant orbiting their star really closely and happen to be lined up perfectly so that we see them passing to the right and left of yeah. their star <laughs> from our or perspective top and bottom. right or top of them yeah yeah but is and or isn't it interesting that the but side to side that it's passing almost directly in front of its star. And yeah. then with the transit method, same thing. What what do you know with the transit method? We find even more planets that happen to be passing exactly in front of their um, in front of their star. So have we found enough? I mean, we found these super earths, mm -hmm. which are pretty interesting. Yes. And not anything like we have in the solar system. Yeah. And then more terrestrial Earth-sized worlds and even smaller found around these red dwarf stars. We don't even really have a, a sample set yet of, of what to find analog Earths. Right exactly. Now. It's, it's sort of like once upon a time when you asked what is the distribution of stars, astronomers kind of went, eh. and And the issue was we didn't have enough infrared capability to understand the population of red dwarf stars out there. And so there were hints that they existed in huge numbers, but to truly understand what is the ratio of tiny stars to big stars, you need to look at a big enough volume of space that you have those rare giant stars. And you need to be able to see that entire volume to a, a faint enough level that you can make out those little red giant, uh, no, not giants, those little no, red no. dwarfs all the way to the edges. And until we had the ability with telescopes like WISE to survey all the little red dwarfs out there, we couldn't even tell you what the ratio of stars was. Well, now instead of having the what's the ratio of red dwarfs to big old white giants. Um, it's more a matter of what is the relationship between the Mercuries and the super Jupiters. And I find it kind of fascinating that there's this 
sweet point in the histogram right now of planet sizes where ice giants seem to dominate. And we don't yet know how much of that is observational bias versus, no, the universe just likes to create ice giants. And like the I, super, like super Earths or, or mini Neptunes or just regular right. old ice giants. Yeah. And, and I love the research that is starting to say that um, you may get super Earths by removing the atmosphere from ice giants. I just love that idea mm -hmm, and I'm mm -hmm. going to bring it up regularly, apparently. So then like, is the, does the presence of these super earths yeah. and even mini Neptunes and stuff, does that give us any kind of sense of, of what could be waiting for us? Like, I wonder if there's like a crossover. Like if you, if you find under a sun like star, you find a bunch of super earths and various other worlds orbiting it. And then you look at a, red dwarf star and you see a certain distribution is there some way to kind of overlap the two to get a sense of of what might be working for us once we can start to image these planets the earth one the other it's, earths so so part of my hesitancy is every time we try to do that the universe is like no you're wrong we we initially thought that red dwarfs could never have large numbers of planets because how could the solar nebula that they formed out of that cloud of gas that only produced this itty bitty tiny star how could it possibly produce a large number of planets and then there's one of the trappist systems being like hey i've got planets for days uh, you want a planet i've got many and and so the more we look the more we realize planets are just going to be everywhere but the one thing we have seen so far is little red dwarfs have, for the most part, littler planets. Hmm. And, and so there's that tendency. And so far, we have only been able to find massive planets around massive stars. And so there's this human tendency to say, well, massive stars must only have massive planets. And it's not going to work that way. And figuring out what the transition is going to look like from little stars have cute little tiny planets, many of which can be in their habitable zones, to massive stars can have any possible kind of planet. And what is the trend? We don't know how to get between those two points right now. There, there's many right, things right. possible. All right. We're going to talk about this some more, but it's time for another break. And we're back. Now we've been talking mostly just about sort of physical characteristics of these planets, but I want to yeah. sort of think in the time domain as well. We're here 13.7 billion years after the big bang, the earth formed four and a half billion years ago. Does our time in the universe have any factor on whether or not we're normal? Do we, were there more planets earlier? Do we think? No, just the opposite is likely true. As our universe has evolved with time, it has had the ability through stellar evolution, through supernovas going off, through neutron stars merging, to create more and more heavy elements. We are, as Carl Sagan pointed out, star stuff. Um, to, to think of it more grisly, uh, we are the leftover bits of stars' dead bodies that have been spewed right. across the universe in amazing explosions right we are we are made of rotting star corpses yeah exactly <laughs> right and take that carl sagan <laughs> it's it's just one of these things where when you have to think about what a star has to go through to get its material to be in a human being the universe is a violent place, but that violence is what led to us being able to exist because so much stuff has has been mixed together. Those but first gen go ahead. Give us sorry, doesn't that give us a like a bit of attention then? Because we know we're way beyond the age of star formation. We are yes. billions of years late to the star formation party, but but we're fairly well positioned in the metals party. Exactly. And, and looking wonder, around the universe, we once thought that we were of average metallicity, and it turns out we are far from average metallicity. We are one of the more metal-rich stars out there. 
Whoa. And this gives us a solar system full of rocky bodies and worlds that are made up of, of far more than just hydrogen and helium. Now, admittedly, when I say far more, I mean that we think that I believe it's 1.03% of the sun is made of things other than hydrogen and helium, and that is still very metal rich. Mm. So it takes a lot to be able to get to planets. And by being late to the party, we are luckily enough metal rich. Now, we are starting to find that there's giant elliptical galaxies out there that have had bursts of star formation in the past and have become extremely metal rich. So in other galaxies, we would probably be late to the party, but in our galaxy, which is the only one we can see planets in right now, right. we are right on time. And then what about position? So, you know, we are, I guess, not too close to the core of the Milky Way, not too far out into the outskirts of the of the milky way does is our position normal it helps our our position i mean the the volume that is made up of 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 the volume that exists to put stars in increases as you look at larger and larger radiuses so so when you look at the inner part of the solar system it is a smaller volume, but it also happens to be way denser. So there's a lot of crazy math involved in saying, are we normal or not normal? What I can say is our distance from the center of the galaxy means we are not somewhere where the stars are so dense that we had to worry about necessarily having planets stolen on a regular basis early on before we had a chance to form life. And we probably don't need to worry about having planets stolen into the future. The crossing distances are just great enough where we are that mm -hmm. it's pretty good. But at the same time, we're not so far out in radius or so far high up from the disk that we're in a more metal poor region of the galaxy. So we found this nice sweet spot where there's enough of the stuff that we need to form rocky planets, but there's not such a density of objects that it's like trying to get through a crowded subway station at rush hour. And, and even factors like being above or below the galactic plane could have a factor as well in the... Yeah. In the in in the formation of the of the solar system and and also the things that came before us so for example astronomers are fairly confident that a that a binary star a binary pair of neutron stars collided in our general vicinity shortly before the formation of the solar system yes would we and... be here without that is that an is that a necessitating factor for for metal dense star systems we're we're still trying to figure that out so we we think we understand that neutron neutron star collisions are required to produce large amounts of things like gold now at the same time other kinds of supernovae give off specific distributions of various heavier elements and there's other things we know are necessary for life like phosphorus for instance and so the question becomes, what are the different ways that you can get at, you have enough heavy stuff, the irons, the nickels, to be able to form iron nickel cores to planets? What are the combinations of supernovae that you need in order to get all of the uh, atoms that go into organic molecules that we see for amino acids and other useful nucleic uh, proteins? Um, Gold is awesome, but was it necessary to get to having life versus life as we know it? And so these are questions that we, because we have a single set, we just don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But for the jewelry economy, it was probably necessary. <laughs> and so it is kind of, I mean, where we stand right now, we're just a month away from say James Webb coming online and being able to start yeah. taking images. It'll probably go after the Trappist system to try and learn more about that. There's a few other planetary systems that it'll be able to discover, but it can't see 
Earth-sized worlds around some like stars. We need something bigger, better. We need yeah. something like the Lubex telescope or the extremely large telescope or something even bigger to come after that. And so I think as we kind of roll to a close here, we're still too early. We're yeah. probably when pick a date. When do you think we could do this show again and know with more certainty how normal the Earth is compared to other planets out there? See, you're requiring me to prognosticate what the global budget for telescope building is going to be. And that is a lot harder to figure out than how long is it going to be until we have the technology we need. Cause but you having... get to guess. Oh, so, man. My guess would years? be, I, I, I'm going to say closer to 20. 20 years. Yeah, because we're going to need we're going to need right. to build something that we can fly and JWST has left me bitter. <laughs> All right. Well, we will be closing in on episode 2000 then of Astronomy Cast when we can do the uh, the episode about about how common the earth is. Exactly. Um, compared to other systems. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Pamela. Thank you, Fraser. And thank you so much to all the myriad people that allow us to do all the things that we do. This week, I would like to thank Will Hamilton, Zero Chill, Felix Gut, Simon Parton, Sminsky, Planetar, Kinsaya Pienflinko, Andrew Stevenson, Bart Flaherty, Stephen Coffey, Glenn McDavid, Karthik Vekatraman, Sean Mart. Martz, Sean Freeman, Blixa the Cat, Rachel Fry, John Drake, Joe Wilkinson, John Ossef, Benjamin Davies, Roland Vormerdam, Dean, Brian Kelby, uh, Nyla, Connor, Peter, Lou Zealand, Arctic Fox, Tim Garrish, Corrine Demptruck, Claudia Mastriani, Jordan Turner, Lee Harborn, Chris Wheelwright, Jason Cardukas, Olivia Bruna Zank, Ron Thorson, Papa1062, Robert Hundu, Kim Baron, Vitali, Paul Esposita, Arthur Latz Hall, Frank Stewart, Ganesh Schwarmanthon, Bob Zatsky, Disastrina Scott Cohn, the Air Major, Kemi Rizan, Ruben McCarthy, Time Lord Iro, Jeff McDonald, Iggy Hammock, and Dave Masfield. If you would like to hear me desperately try to pronounce your name correctly and probably fail, uh, go join our Patreon at patreon.com slash astronomycast. We really wouldn't be here without you. And more to the point, we wouldn't be able to provide all the people behind the scenes the income that we can thanks to you. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. And then they saved. All right. Six, four, four. Six, four, four. Okay, we are done recording. We're now just answering questions. I don't see any questions. The good part. No. <laughs> this is why we have editors. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Uh, Drebsdorf over on Twitch says, you think it comes down to our detection methods that we aren't finding a lot of Earths or 50-50 split between our distribution guesses being wrong? Um, so we're finding plenty of Earth-sized things around small stars. The issue that we run into is it's easy to see small things next to small light sources that are easy to gravitationally move around. It's hard to find small things next to really bright light sources with really big masses that are hard to gravitationally yank around. So it's just difficulty of what we're trying to find. Amen. Um, All right, looking to see what. Okay, you know what? No one's asking questions, so I'm going to excitedly share some TV that I've been watching. Okay. Um, so have you been watching uh, the Strange New Worlds, the Star Trek Strange New Worlds? No, I'm gonna. That's that's my Memorial Day week project. I'm gonna sit down and watch. Yeah, this, I think there'll be four by that point. Yeah. Um, but they're great. They're great. They they are. Uh, they're very similar to Next Generation. Like it's it's. It's what the old was trying to capture in in the Star Trek 
universe really? where you've got where you've got this this five year mission to seek out bold new worlds. Uh -huh. You know, they're bold to go where no one else had gone before, and so it's it's episodic, which. I'm less of a fan of episodic. I much prefer a longer story arc. I like a and mix are... of both. Like X Files did it right, I think. Yeah. To go way back in time. Yeah, I'm, and so I'm. I'm sort of eating my words now as I as I compare <laughs> Discovery versus Strange New Worlds because Strange New Worlds is better. But I think, you know, there's a lot of other things that Discovery is doing wrong that Strange New Worlds is doing right. A biggest part is just the characterization. Like you meet Uhuru in in Strange New Worlds, and you meet all these other characters, and they do a great job of just getting, helping you get to know these characters so well. And yet, when I watch, say, Discovery, I don't know how much how many episodes of Discovery there are, but like, I can name two characters in the show, and and everybody else, I have no idea what they're about. That's the you know, yeah. she's the lady with the with the technology on her face. She's the other Helms operator. Yeah, she's and, the redhead who red, is yeah. going to be a captain, but is struggling with all yeah. sorts of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's so I I'm think also that, bad at names. So well, sure, but um, uh, yeah, I don't remember all the names in Stranger Worlds yet, but I, I think I know more. <laughs> um, <laughs> captain Pike. Number one, uh, Uhuru. I That's guess some cheating. Of you already names. knew I know. Captain Pike. I know. I know. I know. And uh, uh, oh man, the nurse. Now I forget her name. Oh, anyway, yeah, yeah, Chapel, Nurse Chapel. Yes. Um, so it is. Uh, yeah, it's really good. But the thing that blew our minds we watched was the new season of of Love, Death, and Robots. I've heard that's really oh, good. God, it's so good. Okay. Like, both of us were slack jawed with pure enjoyment over and and you know they're sort of like i don't want to say they're hits and misses i want to say that they are home runs and and solid you know doubles <laughs> normally right for for the first the season one and season two yeah. like you're just where you're like picking your job off the ground because you couldn't believe how good that was and so this season it's been all home runs oh. or at least triples so it's just like there's a couple of stories there that i just had i just couldn't believe how good how much how entertained i was by the show like i haven't been that entertained in such a long time you, you think about these moments in your life like i remember watching aliens when i was 14 years old in the movie theater and that i just was scary I, when we were little i, I couldn't I couldn't believe how good and entertaining the show was, how good the movie was. And I was just like, oh, and it just like time went so quickly. And I was just in this, I don't know, this endorphin high the entire time. And and the same thing, Carl and I were watching this new season of Love, Death and Robots. And we were just, we're just like, that was so good, right? Yeah, that was so good. <laughs> 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 yeah yeah it was amazing yeah god it's so good i wish i could like i could wipe memory and go watch them again they're that good that's yeah so just wait a few yeah. years i i know that's the way my brain is is i'll remember i really liked yeah. something and have no idea why right, and then i get to details. enjoy it yeah. again yeah yeah and so and like what i love is they are adapting the the kinds of science fiction stories you would find in asimov magazine mm -hmm. or right and like black mirror just, really like made the point that this will sell if you do this yeah so imagine black mirror but it's not just kind of the same dystopian yeah black bad, black mirror bad. went dark places well but even just sort of covered the same ground like we get it yeah like technology yeah. scary watch out but this is like you know an astronaut walking across the surface of titan uh a a researcher who is working with a hive mind species in a distant in the future of the of the human empire a of uh, a monster on a boat it's 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 just it's it, yeah it's so good it's so good awesome so we do have one yeah. question that is worth answering yeah. um so a a shard rail 
I uh, asked asks basically what what did I mean when I said grab an FM radio to listen to the meteors. So this is super cool. Um, basically, as the meteors streak through the atmosphere, they will reflect back radio stations, but Doppler shifted. And so if you tune your radio to a station that doesn't actually have a station where it's just pure static, you can catch the whistles of, of what's being reflected back by the meteors and, and hear the meteors. It's, it's a great way to add an extra way to enjoy the show, especially for folks who, like me, always seem to be looking in the wrong part of the sky. <laughs> Oops. Um, but you know, it's just a bzz, bzz, as opposed to, yeah, you know, seeing the sky fall. But I, I'm, I'm sure it'll be cloudy for me. So. Yeah, I'm worried about that here too. But yeah. our 10 day forecast is not to be trusted. Yeah. Um, anything else? I, no, I don't see I've, more questions. I've got uh, nothing else. Yeah. Corey S. asks, when will episode 666 be and how close to Halloween? Oh, man. I, I can figure that out. Um, just not in my head right at this moment. Um, yeah. I will probably be able to tell you that the week we get back from Memorial Day break. So we're going to take next week off, um, which means that we can stay up and not try and do a show um, mm -hmm. around our exhaustion and see the Tal Hercules. Uh, and um, yeah, then I'm going to work out the calendar next week for when we're recording next year. So, so we hit our thousand patron goal with Universe Today. Mm -hmm. Woohoo. That's amazing. And the promise that I made was that I was going to do a book club with the, oh. with the viewers. So I've been trying to think about how I'm going to do a book club and I want to just mm -hmm. run some ideas past your brain and maybe yeah. people we're watching right now. So I think my, so, so the, when I talk about science fiction, people want me to read their books, Yeah. not, not the writers, but people want me to read their favorite books. Mm -hmm. And so, and I want to read their favorite books. And, and now this gives me an incentive because now I'm on the hook. I have to read instead of watching TV or playing video games or, right. or, or browsing on Twitter or whatever. And, and so my thought is that I'm going to build a list because I, I, I don't want to manage people. Like I don't want to do cat herding, right? Where yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, hey, is... hey, we're reading this chapter of this book this week. Right, Let's right. talk about it. So I think what I'm going to do is give people a list, like a place where they can suggest and vote up the books yeah. that they want me. Maybe Reddit. Goodreads. Yeah, well, Goodreads. I don't know if you can like create a list. But yeah. You could sort of like like up but people various people can create lists and then various people could vote on the list and it'll put the the them in order of me to read them and then i'll i'll share my thoughts on the book for one of my during one of my shows like we'll give a, a quick review then on the discord we'll do a more in-depth conversation about it if people want to come and and hang out that's my that's my thought so i don't know if people think that's a good that's, idea that sounds cool we're yeah. we're gonna do a review on friday of uh jadzia axelrod's uh new graphic no novel galaxy the prettiest star which has the most unscientific possible name which is why we're going to review it because we like to just go and look at anything that's related to i mean we reviewed the the starlight coke because because starlight right um right. It's really weird. That was the moral. Is that is that actual Coke? Yeah, it's it's like what happens if Coke meets a campfire hmm. with vanilla. And you reviewed it's, it because it has the word star in it. Yeah, exactly. Well, it was it, it says that it tastes like space. Um, right. Did so you? so uh, yeah, we do periodic book reviews and um yeah. This Thursday, though, instead of doing our normal What's Up segment, we actually are going to be interviewing uh, Pierre Martin, who's an expert on the Tal Hercules. So we have that coming up on Thursday. Oh, that's great. Good timing. And yeah. Yeah, we got lucky. So uh, Keeper of Maps, Gordon Dewis, was the one who helped us make that connection. So we're super awesome. grateful for his help. All right. Zephan Zephan asks, what telescope do we need for direct imaging of Earth's around sun-like stars? The eternal question. A big one. A big one. 
so the the <laughs> with a so solar the brightness sun sail so when you put the the planet next to the star yeah. it is the equivalent of it's a it's a billion billion times brighter yeah the star over the planet so you need to be able to remove a billion or reveal a, an object that is a you need to get rid of a billion billion amounts of the light and and then you can resolve the planet itself and the james Webb can't do it the extremely large telescope may be able to just barely for a couple yeah. of stars but to really do it you're going to need something like the james webb with a sun sh with a star shade yeah as well as a chronograph to really block that light or yeah. uh an orbiting star shade that say the extremely large telescope can use here on earth so until that gets done you're not going to be able to to do it I I like want Starship working right now so that we yeah. can fly a doesn't have to be unfolded and takes 20 years to build space telescope with that flower shaped chronograph up and just start looking at this stuff. Yes. But so, and that's, I mean, I think you're right. Like, I think, I think the way this plays out is the extremely large telescope gets completed in 2026. Yeah. And then uh, a star shade for the earth gets launched by 2030, maybe. Yeah. And it, and so we're into the 2030s before we've actually got the right setup to be able to start taking images of, of extrasolar planets. Um, Arjon asks, would ice worlds get minerals dumped into the oceans from ice churn on the surface? Minerals dumped into the oceans. So, so what's the sort material? Of, if if like, you it, have meteors dust? striking the surface, mm. then, then uh, there's a certain amount of recycling that takes place. And you can right. imagine some of the minerals that are dumped on the surface via impacting objects through this convec convection that sometimes occurs get dumped down. Yeah. Okay. So you, would you get like plate tectonics, kind of like Earth at a certain point? Well, with ice we think we see that on Pluto to a certain level. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, okay. like a hundred tons of debris hits the earth every day from space yeah. and rains down on our planet. Yeah. And so if you were on, so you can imagine something similar, like less, but quite a bit, say on Ganymede, you know, dozens of tons of debris is landing on the surface of Ganymede every day. Yeah. And then is somehow making its way down into the ice over time. Yeah. So feeding nutrients down below. It's interesting. All right. We've reached end of our hour, so we should, probably wrap things up. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you for keeping everything on the rails this week. Anything you wanted to specifically announce? I guess you mentioned you already announced them. Well, so we had one more person ask if I'm going to be doing, I do story time over on my Star Strider Twitch channel. Right now we are working our way through for the sheer joy of it. Mer Lafferty's Shambling Guide to New York City. So we're reading that in the evenings to put a little bit of joy in everyone's life. Um, and I'll be doing that tonight at 9 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Easter, 7 p.m. Pacific. And beforehand, if we get ourselves together, there will be the painting of planets or working on the continued creation of a gas giant system in Photoshop. So there will be art. Very cool. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for watching. Thanks to all the mods. Thanks for watching us on YouTube and on Twitch. Yeah. And Pamela, of course, thanks for bringing the brain. And we'll see you all next week. No, Bo two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Not next week. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. And I'm there's the button.